today on the panel we have Eric Rubin. Eric and his husband Jim are longtime members of Men Having Babies New York, and they're proud parents of a baby daughter through surrogacy, through gestational surrogacy. Um, this is Jessica, a mother of two and a labor and delivery nurse from Pennsylvania. Oh my God, what a great surrogate you can have. Uh, and she is a gestational surrogate who carried J Eric and Jim's baby. Uh, next we have Michael Barbaro. Michael is an associate chaplain at the Trinity School in Manhattan. He is a single dad of newborn twin boys. And we also have Danielle <laughs> Pavlak. Uh, Danielle is a Texas stay-at-home mom to four children, triplets, way to go, and a single boy. Uh, and she dealt with fertility problems herself and later carried twins uh, for Michael. So if we would start off, Eric, with you, I just want to do some brief opening comments. Tell, tell us about your journey, what you would like to share with us, and we'll just move right down the line, and then we'll, we'll take questions. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me okay? You may want to pull those up a little closer to you. Okay. So, um, you know, this really was something that I, I always dreamed of. While most people, you know, they were dreaming, as kids, when they were dreaming of being, you know, lawyers, uh, doctors, I, I was always dreaming of being a father. And I think, you know, as I got older, when one of my, fr when my friends started having babies, you know, I found myself becoming very involved in the process. Um, you know, I was the friend that would tag along to the doctor's appointments and, uh, you know, I, I reached, I wanted that for me. And, um, you know, I think, fi you know, f uh, finances were kind of holding us back. So we probably started this process about eight or nine years ago and we were just saving, saving and saving. Um, I mean, do, do you want me to say yeah. more? What yeah, you, yeah, yeah, go. So go right. All right, so once we were at a position where we were able to do this, what we decided, because I wanted to be very involved in this process, I, um, I was competent in myself that I could find somebody on my own. However, I was not competent in my abilities that I could facilitate that process. So um, the agency that we worked with actually had a uh, bring your own surrogate package, which was great. You know, we, we saved a lot of money and they facilitated the process. Now, just if anybody chooses to go that route, then, you know, I will forewarn you, the most craziest people you will ever meet will will contact you. I mean, we had people who, you know, a bipolar woman, she was willing to go off her medication. There was a 18 year old who wanted to move in with us. I mean, you, you name it, I mean, we probably heard it all. Um, and we actually, there were a couple of people we were paired up with and who probably went into the process that did not, um, you know, probably did not really understand fully what it meant to be a surrogate, and it did not pan out. We actually were paired with a woman before Jessica who, uh, I mean, there probably were some red flags that we ignored, and this is where it was good that we did have the agency involvement. You know, they said, well, they, they sent some people to do a home study, and it turned out that this woman was never even pregnant before, so... You know, you just, and it's a very emotional process. So you kind of sometimes let your emotions get the better of you. And, you know, you ignore some of the red flags. Um, you know, when we met Jessica, it just, you know, it's kind of like dating. And, you know, I just, the first time we met, our family got together. We got together in Pennsylvania. And I, it just felt like we had been friends forever. Uh, we just bonded really quickly, and we're just able to, and we just were like, all right, let's go. And, you know, Jessica knew I wanted to be really involved with the process. Uh, she was completely okay with me going to appointments. She, I mean, which was, I mean, she was in uh, Scranton, PA, which was about three hours, which was not terrible at all. Uh, we were able to go to doctor's appointment. She would send us pictures of her ever-developing stomach, which was awesome. Uh, she sent, you remember the uh, picture of the heartbeat where we could hear the heartbeat for the first oh, yeah. time? So, you know, she did keep us very involved in the process. Um, let me 
see. And, you know, we... Um, sorry. It's, uh, you know, just because I've been to so many of these, and now that I'm up here, I'm like, wow. <laughs> it's, it's, it, is, it is a very emotional process. Um, but, you know, we did, Jessica did allow us into the delivery room with her, and, you know, we got, I'm a very, very squeamish person. I never, <laughs> ever in a million years thought that I would be able to sit through that, but it was just so amazing, you know, every second of it, and um, I, you know, something else which was really cool was we, you know, we shared a room after, after our dog my daughter was born and it was kind of like uh, a sleepover for three days mm -hmm. where you know Jessica gave me parenting tips and it, it was just an amazing amazing experience worth all the worth everything I would do it all over again in a heartbeat thank you thank you very much Jessica tell us tell us from your point of view a little bit about the story um Eric touched oh can you guys hear me my God, I, sp I speak really fast and I get nervous and this is a big crowd, so just excuse me for that. Um, Eric touched on a lot of it. Uh, questions that I usually get asked are, you know, why did I do it? And I've always, as, a, you know, an OB nurse, you know, you see a lot of families that were unexpected um, or not meant to be or, you know, problems and social issues. And it's so rare that you see parents who truly, truly want to have a baby and want to work hard and want to be there for every single process to be there for you know that first heartbeat and the ultrasounds you know they just really want babies and some people don't have that opportunity and surrogacy you know has made this this wonderful new way for to make families you know families that truly want to exist and that's something that touched me and that's something I wanted to be involved in and so my husband and I had talked about it for a long time, and you know, when the time was right, it, we knew it was going to be beneficial for our family. It was going to benefit somebody else, and so I, you know, I, I put myself out there, and um, I was I was contacted by by some some strange people too, and that was to be expected. And then, um, you know, what what drew me to Eric and Jim was they just spoke real, really like truly about themselves and their feelings, and and that was something that lasted up until this day, you know, they're just open about everything and let me know where they stood and what they wanted and how they wanted to work and, you know, what they were open to. And um, I appreciated that. And so when we met, it was, it was just fate. It was, you know, like finding, finding your match and it was perfect. And when they call it a surrogacy journey, it is. And um, something I wanted to touch on was that surrogacy is not a, a perfect process. You know, it took us three tries you know, and almost it was like seven months be between the first transfer and, and the one that was successful. You know, I had a miscarriage, I had a chemical pregnancy. We, you know, we lost a twin at one point, Ellie's, Ellie's twin, but you know, and then, and then finally, eventually we started getting the good. And then um, at the end I did have, you know, a difficult delivery, but I would never, not for a second, change one bit of it. It was just one of the most rewarding experiences, and I love talking about it, and I like when people have those crazy questions for me and uh, wonder, you know, how you could do that, how my husband, who was unbelievably supportive for everything, you know, to be there for it, too. It was just this great, almost magical kind of process that you just get wrapped up in, and, um, you know, I get to see pictures of Ellie still to this day. You know, I saw her in her Tinkerbell Halloween costume <laughs> for, <laughs> for Halloween. You know, so I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and, um, you know. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, Michael, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. I was sitting up here and realized that if you're in the back, and you can't see that there's a baby on my lap, I must look crazy rocking back and forth. So there's a child on my lap right now, so that's why I'm rocking back and forth. I'll try to stop that while I'm speaking. Um, I'm going to echo Eric's story a little bit. I wanted to be a dad since I was 17. It was one of the only things in my life that I was totally sure about. I didn't come out until I was 30, and one of the reasons why it was so hard for me to come to terms with being gay was I thought I was giving up the... Um, Oh, I'm going to get emotional up here. <laughs> it happens. Um, Trust me. Yeah, yeah. It took me by surprise. I, I, I thought I'd given up the dream of being a dad. So um, it is a miracle to me to be sitting up here. And um, I do have twin boys. One is out there crying. So um, that was the hardest reason why I, I didn't want to accept that I was gay. I had a girlfriend at the time. We talked about having kids. We were on our way to marriage. And I had to deal with all of that. And so 
coming to terms with that to me meant letting go of the dream of being being a dad. And so, um, I over the years, uh, you know, it took about ten years as I was coming to terms with everything and being in seminary. And I looked into adoption, and that's really difficult as a as a gay person, as we all know. And I at one point was two contracts in with um, I was going to be co-parenting with a lesbian couple. And my family and friends were not supportive of that only because they knew how much I wanted to be a full-time dad. And they were like, you're, you're, this is going to destroy you to not be around the baby every day. And for me, my answer was, well, it's, it's this or nothing. And I had really dismissed the whole idea of surrogacy. Um, just I'm a teacher, so I was like, I am not going to be able to pay for that. So that was really the one thing that was holding me back. And last, uh, I guess it was last Easter, um, I was with my mom, and, and we were out to brunch, and I got all emotional. I'm kind of an emotional person, <laughs> as Danielle has found out through our <laughs> surrogacy journey. <laughs> it's the gay flair in me. Um, but I got really emotional, and I thought, you know, I, I, what I feel like I've been called to do in my life is to be a dad. And at that time, I was 44, and I said, it's never going to happen. And, you know, my mom said, well, why? Why is this not going to happen for you? And I thought... You know, because I'm, I'm bright. At the time, I was in a relationship, but it was kind of ending. And I thought, you know, I, I don't think I can do this as a single dad, and I don't know how to pay for it. And she just looked at me and said, you know, if, if you do this, no matter how hard it is, when you're 70, you will never look back and regret it. But knowing you, you know, not, parenthood is not for everybody, <laughs> but knowing you, you're called to be a dad. And if you don't do it when you're 70, you're going to regret it it really hit me really hard. And the next day I was on the internet and I was exploring how to do the whole surrogacy thing. So quick journey down that road is um, I looked into India first because it seemed to be way more affordable. And then uh, India closed its doors to, to uh, gay people doing surrogacy. I then moved to Thailand and was in conversation with two agencies in Thailand. And um, things just started to get a little sketchy um, in many different ways. I, uh, one of my best friends has a baby via surrogacy in Thailand, so it, it has proven for him. But for me, it started to get uh, just really complicated. And, and I felt it was also really important for me to be involved every step of the way in the surrogacy process. I wanted to go to the appointments. I wanted to know who was carrying the baby. So I kind of ruled out Thailand and then um, started looking into different agencies and joined the Men Having Babies group and was going to some of those meetings and, and found out about my agency, Simple. And uh, I wasn't able to come to this uh, conference last year, but I watched all of it online at like 3 o'clock in the morning in lying in bed, wishing I was, had a baby. And so watched all the different videos and um, really was drawn to Simple because uh, the two owners of Simple, one was a surrogate and one was an egg donor. And I really liked that aspect that they had that um, twist on, on what was going on. This is the other little guy. Mm -hmm. So signed uh, with an agency on June 1st, and you know I, I can fast forward through most of the pregnancy um, because it was, I, I've never been told I was boring in my entire life, but during the whole pregnancy, every time we went to the doctors, they're like, you guys are boring, nothing's happening. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. Um, I'm gonna jump back though because it was to, to the moment I met Danielle, my surrogate, which was a, a very special moment. I was matched with Danielle, and the other thing that I liked about how that worked was Danielle got to choose me, so I had to write a letter to my potential surrogate, and that went out to a bunch of different surrogates, and then the surrogates had the um, ability to choose who they were interested in working with, so it felt fair to me. Um, so I wrote a letter, very emotional letter, and uh, Danielle, we were put in con contact, and the first time we met was via Skype. I was in, actually in Argentina, and we Skyped. And I, the moment I knew I was going to choose Danielle was, at one point, we were talked about a lot of deep stuff. And at one point, I said, so how's your first date with a gay man going? She goes, it's going great. I put on a pretty top for you. And then she <laughs> zooms she zooms the camera down, and she does like a little boob shake. And I was like, yes, you are the one who's going to carry my children. <laughs> so, um, from that moment on, we just started, you know, started our journey. The hardest part for me, honestly, one of the hardest parts, I shouldn't say the hardest part, but it was very difficult to choose an egg donor. Um, it was like going, becoming straight again and online dating. Um, I wanted to choose Sofia Vergara. I wanted a, I'm short, so I wanted a really tall, dark Latina with a, you know, doctorate degree. Uh, <laughs> that didn't work out. Um, I had a, an amazing egg donor. She's 5'3 and blonde. 
And uh, I'll tell you that as you're going through the process, it, it is hard to choose an egg donor. And, and the moment that was very crucial for me was I was sitting with friends and I was agonizing over who to choose. And I loved, um, I loved my egg donor's profile. We had Skyped, I loved her. We really hit it off and I was really stuck on stupid, what made me feel like a very shallow person, but I'm gonna be honest because you're gonna get to that point, you're gonna feel shallow as well. Maybe not, maybe not as shallow as I did. <laughs> I didn't mean to put that on you. But it's, it's, it's a hard process and I just realized that at one point in, in time, my children will say to me, why did you choose the egg donor you chose? And I wanted to be able to say something more than she was tall and pretty. I wanted to say you know, that she was just you know, a good person and um, I'm a teacher and my egg donor's a teacher and those are the things that really mattered. And you get caught up in it because it, it, it does. You, you get profiles of 600 women and you're trying to choose you know, this, somebody who looks like you and you get all caught up in it. But um, for me, the, the bottom line was who, who could I say with pride to my children, this is the person, this, this is the other half of your genetics. So the first time um, I went out to Texas to do what we all have to do to have babies um, <laughs> with the clinic, I, I was in conversation with Danielle and with my egg donor, Holly, and they both independently of each other said, why don't the three of us get together? And I was like, really? Oh my gosh, how awkward is this gonna be? And uh, I'll, I'll just add that I'm Italian, and they said, what type of food do you like? And I said, Italian food. And they said, great, we have an olive garden. I was, like, I was like, and I'm going to Texas. <laughs> so there we were at the Olive Garden. We all met. It was one of the most fun nights I've ever had. Um, it's all on film, and we just had a blast uh, with each other. And it was, um, you know, we just kind of all came together, and it all felt right. And then uh, flashback through, you know, um, through the whole pregnancy. And, and I honestly, I will say I wanted twins. Could only afford to do this process once. People thought I was crazy. People say crazy things to you when you have twins. They're like, well, what are you going to do now? I'm like, it's not an Amazon order. You, I didn't accidentally click two. You can't like go, you can't decrease. Um, so I wanted twins and I was thrilled that it worked out that way. And you know, there, there, are, there are surprises that come along the way and uh, things that happen, but it's, um, I've had a beautiful journey and Danielle's uh, now a, a dear friend and, and family member, I would say, is what we are, is we're family. So. Open to questions whenever that part comes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle, you want to yeah. share your story? All right. <clears throat> okay, I hope you all can hear me. Um, as uh, My name is Danielle Pavlock. I am a stay-at-home mom to four-year-old triplets and a two-year-old two son. What led me to <clears throat> surrogacy is me and my husband uh, dealt with fertility issues ourselves. And we, at one point in time, were told that we may not be able to have our own children. And then finally we went to a clinic and we did IUI and uh, fertility medication and we were blessed the first time with triplets, two boys and a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so like I said, that's what led us to um, surrogacy because both me and my husband feel, um, as Michael has told me in our journey, is when you come into this, you're feeling a little broken. And I did feel broken, and my husband felt broken because we were told we may, ne we may never be able to have this. And so we were blessed with our triplets first time, and then we have our five percenter or our bonus baby, as I say. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had always wanted to be a surrogate, but I didn't know how to um, research for it. I didn't know how to go about it. And actually, my story begins is I sold a breast pump to somebody who was friends, and she, my friend now, is a really dear friend of mine, um, had signed up with Simple Surrogacy. And she told me about Simple Surrogacy, and so I went on the website and I looked at them, and I saw one of the videos that they had done at a conference like this, and what also drew me to them was, you know, of course, they had been surrogates themselves and egg donors, and they let me choose who I wanted to speak to first. And I'm an older, I'm an older uh, mom, and I really didn't think that because I was older that anybody would want to choose me. But they're like, oh, man, she's 38. She's not going to be able to have a good pregnancy. She's not going to be, you know, able. I don't want her. She's old. Because when you go into this, a lot of people are thinking that it is um, younger the better. And when we had gone through it, we found out is it's actually the quality of the embryos and not the age of the surrogate. So I was like, I'll do it. Filled out my profile, uh, sent it into Simple. Stephanie called me up. We had a great interview, all that. And um, she felt me out, and 
I was at first when I went into it, I was going to carry for a traditional surrogate because of my husband and I. But then I was like, you know, everybody deserves to be a parent regardless of, you know, if they're purple, white, gay, straight, whatever. And everybody needs to have the 230 feeding and to be blessed. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much Michael is. is Sleep uh, deprived. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much Michael is uh, saying about me at uh, 230 in the morning when the boys won't go back to sleep. But so then... Um, so I put my profile out there, and like Michael said, is simple allows you to, um, as a surrogate, to choose who you want to talk to at first. And I went through a first batch, and I just wasn't quite feeling it. And then I had an interview with another couple, and just something we didn't connect at all. And then um, around July, beginning of July, they had sent me Michael's profile, and I was reading through it, and I was like, you know... At first, I was like, mm, he's going to be a single dad. Um, I don't know how well that will go. But then I went back to him. I was like, I was raised by a single mom. I think I turned out okay. Mm. And uh, <laughs> mm. some people may beg to differ. And then um, <laughs> so I sent who I wanted to talk to. I said, okay, I want to speak to Michael. I want to speak to, and then a couple other people. And he was in Argentina, and it was around the holidays. So we were kind of having a hard time uh, matching, getting together and everything. So we finally... Skyped and once we got into it, I felt like I was catching up with an old friend. And I also wanted somebody who wanted to be as involved in the pregnancy as much as they possibly could. I was always open for Michael to come to any and all of my appointments and, um, and he made it work. And so here's the hard part is, is about surrogacy. Coming from a surrogate, um, there is it is a beautiful process, but then there's also a lot of hate, judgment, and uh, and everything like that. Um, I had been told, because I am Catholic, that I am sinning against the church, and I am sinning against God. And so when I told Michael that, um, what, and this is what you also want, is you can do for your surrogates, is when I told Michael that, he reached out to everybody of all of his friends, and I got so much love and so many letters from people saying that I that no matter what, I was doing a beautiful thing and a wonderful thing and not to let the people um, who are being hateful, um, you know, continue to drag me down because I was doing a beautiful thing. And also, too, is my agency has a great support system with that is, you know, we girls um, have a Facebook page that we can talk to each other with about our, our emotions and everything. And... Um, and so, like I said, we are family now. Um, I love the boys. Another question I got is how can you give them up? And I went into it as knowing that I was helping a family and that they were not mine. And I, I kind of equated it to extreme babysitting as I got, daddy went on a date, <laughs> daddy went on a date night. I had them for 37 weeks and three days. And then I as, wish I had a date that lasted yeah, that long. And then <laughs> as soon as uh, daddy's date was over, I handed them over, and I love the boys, but I love them as my nephews, and um, I hope that I can be a big part of their life as they're growing up. Michael has kept me in the loop. I was actually here two weeks ago visiting with him, meeting his mom for the first time, and uh, we just had a couple firsts together. We went to, um, we saw our first Latina parade together. We went to <laughs> our first subway, subway ride together, and we went to St. Patrick's Cathedral, and you know, I am, I know I did the right thing, and I will do it again. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause for everyone on the panel, please?